this last month, and we asked our assistant town manager, uh, Ms. Crockett, to put together a memo on it and do a little bit of uh, investigation, particularly as it relates to the state. So, because that's all that. So, go ahead. Thank so, you. in your memo that it's included in your packet, um, I mentioned that the state legislature was going to be looking at two bills, um, LD238 and LD1539, both of which had language incorporated into them that gave municipalities the right to regulate medical marijuana through their land use ordinances. And so what I have recommended to you as an ordinance committee is that we not continue this conversation regarding odor until after the state has acted on those two um, LDs. And today, so the session has adjourned, and they have chosen not to take those up yet. So they have um, been held over. January. Uh, or until the, there's a, until the veto session. So they <laughs> expect to hold another session in okay. 10 days, um, and that's you know part of the veto session, if you will. And these are able to be taken up at that time. Okay. If they again push them off, then yes, we might be looking at January instead. So I would encourage us, I would encourage you to consider at least not having any further conversation regarding this until those bills have passed. After I mentioned that, I said if you did want to discuss them now, um, <laughs> that I would ask you to kind of consider three possible challenges to any ordinance to do with odor. Um, first, of course, is how highly subjective odor is, and that, um, and I wasn't actually being flippant, but I said short of certifying a code enforcement officer's nose, which is a real thing, mm -hmm. we can in fact make that happen, um, this ordinance may be extremely difficult to enforce because of the subjectivity of, of odor. Um, and also just kind of, we talked about this from kind of last year's experience, that we want to be careful about when we bring forward ordinance language based on one person's concern. Mm -hmm. And um, to my knowledge, we do not have any wide scale odor complaints outside of sanitary district concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so this might not be language that we need to have right now. And then the third thing that I saw as a real challenge for Scarborough is that lot sizes are quite different. And the language that I've pulled together for you is based on smell past a lot line. And there's a real difference between um, a house that's a quarter acre lot and its neighboring quarter acre lot, and if we're in our more agricultural areas of town where you might have five to 10 to 20 acre lots. And that um, there's a real difference between what we can expect to have not cross a lot line, especially something like odor, which is carried by air. Yep. So those are the challenges that I kind of wanted you to think about before we headed into the language, if you decided to head into the language, given the state's um, lack of action that would give us more authority to govern across the sector, um, both recreational and medical, with that language in included. We do have a couple of citizens here um, who have come in to, to speak to us regarding the odor ordinance, so if you guys are all right with it, I ask them to uh, okay. state your name and your address and what your concerns are uh, regarding this. Yes, my name's Michael Sawyer. I was down here on Four Track View Terrace. Um, I'm the neighbor she's complaining about. Oh. <laughs> uh, I've lived there all my life, just about, right on Sawyer Road. Uh, I've been smoking marijuana since I was 13 years old. Uh, I was more than happy when they legalized it so I could grow my own and not have to pay for it anymore. Um, I have cerebral palsy and a lot of other medical things. I'm on Social Security. I can't afford to grow it inside. I can't afford to go pay for it at the medical marijuana place. It's, it's just out of my wheelhouse. Um, also, what I want to, oldest, like you said, it's hard to kind of police because where we are now is zone for animals. I can have pigs, chickens, and you know, what you gonna think of those smells? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my cousin right next door has goats. You know, uh, lady down the road, she has chickens and some other animals, I think. You know, so their neighbors have to put up with that smell. Mm -hmm. And you putting houses so close together now, it's hard not to smell what the, your neighbor's cooking. You know, I guess that's all I get to say about it, you know. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Appreciate you. your input. 
Mr. Sawyer, is it uh, uh, being grown under the medical marijuana or the recreational marijuana ordinance? Uh, it has been both. Both? I've done it both ways. And, and you may, if, if I get my license, I have had more plans. But it costs $200 for license of the year. Yeah, OK. And, uh, and so you, you, you find that uh, it, from a health point of view, it helps you? Oh, yeah. I'm a very wound up person. I can get wound up very easily. OK. I and mean, it helps me stay calm. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. How many, how many plants do you, do you grow at, the, at your house? Uh, I grow up with 18 plants. 18. And my sister, I grow for my sister. Also grow for your sister. Yep, and then does that and then that lasts the whole year. You grow, you have one growing season, harvest yeah. in the fall. Yeah. And, and um, that. the article that came out, I mean, Rita said, she said the, the plants stunk when I first put them in. They don't stink when you put them in. They don't start having a smell until the end of July. Yeah. And then August and September, by then, sometime in September, you harvest them in the second week, probably. So it's a month and a half that you're going to get that real. And if I grew inside, people grow inside, and they pump the air outside yeah. from the plant, well, the inside plants smell way worse than the outside plants. <laughs> and you don't have to filter it. You know, people do buy a filter for it, so they're yeah. the neighbors if you're very close. But you don't have to. There's no law against it. Sure. OK. Any other questions? For so I, I believe one of the other complaints was around the fencing, if I'm recalling correctly, when that complaint came in. Do you, do you, do you have fencing around the? Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's, all, it's, it's, it's all fenced in, locked up. Foot high chain link fence with yeah. the gate. This and and that's locked. Do, right. so, have I mean, locked it's up. All, it, yeah. The police officers have been there twice, have looked at it. There's, there's nothing, I mean, it isn't like somebody can just walk into his yard and do something. It has to go through a locked gate. Right. And he also has motion detectors up around it so that it's, it's a secure, secure right now. secured yeah. environment. In it. And I know um, just from my wife goes to dialysis in Portland. There's a big growth facility right, right up behind this dialysis place, indoor, mm -hmm. that you go, you pull in that parking lot and the women, I know the women that come out of that place, ooh, can you smell that? You can. It's a very, sure. and that's um, an odor that you can smell. Almost it's every day. Fine point road. Can you so smell I, mean, I just this. I know it's one lady that's complained about Michael. She's mad at the people she bought the property from because she asked what was behind the blue enclosed because it was all enclosed in so you couldn't even see it behind what was in there. He would not tell. He told he was working with the town about it. Getting the fence so down. Yeah. She she was asked and she wanted to know and that he was the contractor was aware of what was going on because I he told started him. building I said, might want to tell I the people you told him to help you to He let him know up front that he grows yeah. legal marijuana. And, it, you know, he's trying to be a, a good neighbor with a so, good contract. Sure. Let him know, know. Let him know that it, sure. I understand her issue, but yeah. decided, she said she doesn't want to have to explain to her children what marijuana is. Well, it's, it's getting to be a, almost, it's going to be an everyday thing mm -hmm. within a short time. I mean, yeah. so yeah. That, I just know he gets okay. worked up and I don't want him to keep that. So <laughs> okay. So that's being a good friend. <laughs> well, my cousin. So I mean, I, nah. I lived in Australia and went across from the but Well, until I moved out of there when I was 20, but yeah. I, I was kind of like born. I also have a principal garden that I grow. Yeah, right yeah. Here. sure. Right, he does a multi. Okay. He does more than just his marijuana. All right. <laughs> Tomatoes, cucumbers, yep. squash, corn, celery. I mean, so it is a, yep. a god, god. It is. Yep. So, but okay. it is all closed in. Everything oh. is an eight foot high fence. I mean, security. Oh. So, in fact, I'm putting on another fence up the around, around the full property. So I'm not my dog. Oh, up, okay. So. Okay. All right. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you very much for that for that input. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so we're all set. So we're all set. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. All right. Um, well, I think, conversation. Can, yeah. Can I just ask a question before we move on? Uh, do we have anything in there about duration of the odor? Yep. So it mentions, okay. um, and this is of course 
something that can be changed up, but it says in when you're looking um, after in section B, it says for the purposes of this regulation, two odor measurements shall be made within a period of one hour. These measurements mm -hmm. being separated by at least 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's, that language is an attempt to not, if it's just a passing odor that's right. going to dissipate, this is not something that needs enforcement. Right. I know personally, um, I would just as soon wait and see what the state's doing because I'd hate to see us put something into effect that's as subjective as this, number one, no, but number two, and then have the state come back and we'd have to go back to the process and either change mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, but that's where I come from. No, absolutely. This, I mean, so. it makes no sense to, to uh, put something in place that may... And it's it's a trick. It's a terribly tricky issue. Hmm. You know, Absolutely. Regulating this is. I think one of the things that we had talked about last time was around the level mm -hmm. and possibly making it so that it's beyond. Um, beyond level, I don't recall. Did, did we say beyond level three? Yep. So the level four and higher. Yep. Okay. Underneath um, where we just were with the period of one hour. You go, it says, based on the following nuisance levels, the code enforcement officer shall exclude or restrict uses that produce or emit an odor beyond a lot line that is above a level three. And so that would mean only for levels four and five. Mm -hmm. um, and level three was an odor of moderate intensity that would be readily detected and be regarded with disfavor. You pass over. And then level four would, would be air that would make the air very unpleasant. Right. Uh, that would force Whatever itself upon the attention of the average <laughs> right. person. And so that would be where it would become enforceable. It was at that level. Right. I can see what you, your point about subjectivity. Mm. Okay. So above two, uh, make the uh, property owner aware of it. Above level three, enforcement. Right. Mm -hmm. And apparently in Biddeford, when this is, I'm using um, knowledge from uh, Jay Chase. I went to go talk to him about what we had for odor standards in our um, commercial yeah. and industrial areas, and we don't really, in our performance standards, we don't really have any clear language regarding odor, but he said that in Biddeford, when they had, when Merck was operating in Biddeford, the code enforcement officer there actually did have a certified nose, and I don't know who, what agency it was, would come up and they'd put like a gas mask on him, and Jay described it kind of like a hearing test, where, you know, you're like, raise your left, you know, your hand if you can hear the noise, and it was kind of like that, and he, the, it was a man that was the code enforcement officer, and he had to be able to detect the odors as they were pumped into his thing in order to remain certified so that he could go to a property and his nose could be the judge of is this is this property now having a dangerous or offensive level of odor that is unacceptable um, so th things like that are possible and that would take some of the subjectivity out you know there, there would be this you know we could we could <laughs> but it, it does get to be a little comical right because yes. and all and potentially really challenging to find a code or enforcement officer who happens to also have really powerful smell senses or could pass the Jimmy Durante test right. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so what would you gentlemen like to do Ooh. Well, we've, we've had a good uh, staff effort to get us introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, this, the, talk about the, the one instance in which we actually have an odor issue. How, how would you, if we had this in place, would it be fair? We couldn't enforce it right now. I just want to be very clear. Right now, the municipalities, I, I believe that I'm correct in this, have no legal authority to use land zoning code enforcement to regulate medically grown marijuana. That's and that's what the language is that we're waiting on. So yeah. I think even with, if we were passing something like this, even with our current situation, I don't think it would have any impact there because he does have a right to grow medically, and as he mentioned, the police have been there. He is following all of the laws regarding medical grow. And so I don't think even adopting this language would allow the would allow Scarborough to enforce anything regarding his grow. He has the full right to do so. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the state's uh, medical growing uh, uh, statute does not restrict uh, odor means that the municipality is they're, they're regulating in this area, and so we have no authority to regulate in right. this area. And further than that, so we can't, like, one of the suggestions was that he could be forced to grow inside, and as he mentioned, he's like, I can't afford to grow inside. 
the state has made it very clear, we do not have the authority to insist that he do so because he's a medical grower. Were he a recreational grower, were that his avenue in, that would change this discussion. Um, but we're kind of waiting on real clear guidance from the state regarding that as well. So they should have an answer for us. If not at this veto vote, they've got to deal with it next session. They can't continue to punt. Is it because the medical marijuana statute prohibits municipal further municipal regulation? Or is it that it doesn't permit any regulation? I believe, and I would, I'm happy to look into this further, but I believe that the state has just said pretty blanket across, we have set the guidelines for medical grow. We are, we're cornering that market. You guys right. are out. So like, we've, right. made, we've made the standards. Right. Right. You don't have the authority to do further than that. Yeah. I mean, I could, because if you wanted to restrict it, you could put something onerous in, and that would negate the medical marijuana law. Right, right. And so, just just so I'm clear, so even the so this odor, as part of the good neighbor policy, the odor ordinance would be considered a land use ordinance, and we would there and it would have, therefore not have the authority for, to regulate medically grown marijuana. My so understanding is that there is nothing that we could put in place right now as a municipal ordinance that would um, usurp the authority the state has given to medical marijuana growers. So does the person who brought the complaint understand that, that, that we're not empowered? I don't know if we have communicated that to her clearly. I haven't heard any more from her. I mean, no one, this is on ordinance or whatever, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, we should so. probably reach out and, and uh, let's reach out yeah. and inform her that the medical and I can pull you the statute language if you'd like, so that that can be yeah, that, that would conversation. be helpful. That, that, yeah. I think that would be helpful. I mean, it kind of because it kind of ties our hands. There's really yeah. no point in moving forward, even if we did want to address a single complaint, yeah. where this would have not addressed that even that one complaint. Yeah. And um, and while you're at it, it's my it's and I'm digging deep here with my real estate stuff, and I should know this. I believe that there's a state statute too that has to do with agricultural uses and odors sure. from our agricultural uses, because I know that. We're required in real estate to notify people if they think they're moving into a place that's at, at agriculture uses because it's odors. Right. You yeah. know, horse manure, cow manure, pigs, whatever, whatever. But towns, again, are somewhat, not, there's some restrictions around that. But okay. Have I'm, you ever spoken with the lady who brought this forward? This, no, not directly. Who, who would be the appropriate person to? to we coordinate that. I have a contact. It seems to me that probably it would be a good right. suggestion is to ask the town manager and the assistant town manager to coordinate okay. communicating that because yeah. I so think I would, that's pretty, I think you're right. I can't imagine the legislature would allow towns to regulate m medical marijuana uh, in a manner that could, uh, for all intents and purposes, prohibit it, right. the growth of it, by just putting an onerous odor provision in your in your ordinances. So I'm, I'm figuring you are probably 100% right on that. Mm -hmm. So um, push this off? Yeah, I guess I'll move to a uh, table uh, and uh, request that the town manager and assistant town manager confer on a communication to the person who brought forth this uh, concern. Uh, at her property uh, to explain uh, the, the legal framework involved here. Do you have a date certain for table? Uh, yeah, I think it would be uh, uh, the first meeting in January of 2019. Okay. On the assumption that there will not be any advancement of this whole issue then, but we can bring it up before that. Great. If in, during if, the veto great. session. Yeah. Sure. But otherwise, it just remains in a tabled position until we'll look it back at it in January of 2019. Second. Vote? Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that. Lisa. Yeah, that's good. Actually, good work. All right. And now.
We're going to switch from that to moorings. <laughs> we cover all sorts of things in ordinance. <laughs> um, this came before us, if you may recall, uh, actually uh, the town clerk uh, had some concerns about the, uh, we have a long, 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 long list of, of folks who are on waiting lists for mooring permits. Uh, I did speak at length to David Green, and I have not, I have to apologize, I've been so out straight, I haven't had a chance to uh, talk to, he gave me the name of someone else. I know Peter had said something about, uh, what's the name of the committee, Shelf, not Shelf, um, Harbor, Coastal Waters. Co thank you, Coastal Waters, it had come up there before. Um, Larissa has done some drafting of of um, one of the one of the matters that I know uh, Mr. Anderson brought up, which was the if we at least had proof of boat registration, which I know is a that's a usual issue with folks with moorings. But um, again, uh, Larissa, you mind sure. talking about? So in your packet, you see um, the section of the. Zoning ordinance, zoning ordinance, or harbor ordinance, rather, that um, has to do with moorings. And then you also have the permit application that we give to people for the waiting list. Mm -hmm. And I've made some suggested um, text additions to both of those. So if you look at the um, Article 5, Regulations Concerning Anchoring, Mooring, and Security of Vessels, that first section I heard from um, Officer Anderson that he wanted he recommended that we add proof of boat registration, that we add a set date to moor, and that maybe we talk about um, if you've got a guest coming, how does he mm -hmm. know that that boat is there as a guest and that we're not having kind of an Airbnb situation on our moorings. Mm -hmm. So um, first line in section 1A includes the language proof of boat registration in the same name as the mooring applicant must be shown prior to a mooring permit being issued. That's one set of suggested language. In the table that gives um, dates and for different size, uh, not dates, um, instructions, specifications for different things, I've added just for all of them set date to more of July 1, seeing that that's enough time to get a boat in the water if you're going to be using that boat in the water. Um, and then finally, in the subletting of mooring space, adding language that, so it already said that the owner uh, of any vessel having mooring space shall not sublet that said mooring space or mooring space to another user or boat owner. However, another boat owner may use the mooring provided the original owner pays the fee or fees and has requested permission from the harbor master to moor such vessel. So I've added to that end of that sentence. So we're going to be asking, for requesting permission through application for a temporary mooring use permit. Each permit allows for one vessel to be moored for no more than seven consecutive days. That's mm -hmm. answering um, Officer Anderson's concern about not knowing if it's a, a guest. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to add onto the waiting list, Tody and Tracy mentioned that it would be helpful to have people's email addresses so that we could send them information when we needed to. So that's been added on there as a suggestion. And then important information to know, first one right off the bat, proof of boat registration in the name of the mooring applicant is required prior to a permit being issued. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then just adding that the mooring permits are non-transferable um, except on a temporary basis and adding in that language that leads them to the, um, the language regarding the temporary use permit. Okay. And then I just highlighted for you though, um, th this highlight doesn't exist currently, but I wanted you to see that we do already on this application s let them know that all moorings must be in by July 1. Yep. Um, and so that July 1 date on the first part is, is consistent with the documents that we already have in place. And then Tody suggested that we, um, we strike the mooring fees section because those change each year and, and we don't need to include them on the permit application. Okay. Is there, so this looks like it's the uh, application to get on the waiting list. Is there a form that they would, once they have the permit, that they fill out every year to retain their? I yeah. don't believe so. I asked Tody if I needed to mm -hmm. update a, a permit application because I went online to see is there a permit application to download, and she said that no, because the waiting list is so long. I, I don't remember exactly how that worked out, but she assured me that no, I had all of the, the pertinent items to be working with. But they have to still pay their annual fee. Right, and I, I can look into further about maybe where there's some miscommunication. It does seem that there would be an initial application. Um, Tom, do you know how that works? I do not. 
Tracy, I don't know. Well, no, they come in and put their name on a waiting list, and typically it's 10 years. I've been in this position for five years. I haven't seen very many move. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah. they don't, some of them don't even have boats yet who go on the waiting list because they're waiting to get a mooring. So they will put, you know, waiting to get mooring so that they don't have any boats yet. What about on an annual basis, though, for their... They go, we send them out, we send out the application that looks something like this, and it's normally filled in, and when they get it, when the person gets it, they will look it over, change anything that they need to change, and then sign off on it, and then send in their, their money, or bring it into us, one of the two. So there is a boring application form. Oh, that's the people that ha currently, the have, currently them. have them. Yes. I will track that down. So yeah, the boring application good. form signed by the applicant. Yeah. And then signed by the uh, harbor master. It's not signed by the harbor master. Just submit the application. Yep. Okay, with a check for yeah, whatever and the fee. Yeah, then we have down below that Tody and I use for our office use only. We write how did they pay for it, how much did they pay for it, and when they received their mooring sticker. And 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 I, as I recall, Officer Anderson. Um, one of one of the issues is you could have a mooring and you could have the mooring sitting out there with nothing on it, and I don't know how often that's occurring because they don't have a boat, um, and so they're taking up space or taking up a mooring, and that, as I recall, was his. That's why he asked us to put proof of boat registration. Right now, boat registration uh, is not synonymous with the boats in the water. Not necessarily, but and, so and we have double duty there. Boats in the water is not synonymous with all moorings must be in. I assume it means must be in the water. Yes. Yeah. Uh, by July one. Uh, yeah. Is the intent here to make sure that the boat is attached to the mooring by July one? That's a good question. I thought that was the. Yeah. Thing that we're going to require the mooring to be actively used by July one, so that we, you know, the boat could be registered, but it's sitting in your yard. Right. So what does the so I am not a boat person, so <laughs> I apologize if I've used the wrong language. What does the do the words set date to moor? Uh, does that mean boat attached to mooring? It would to me, but I. Well, yes and no. I need to also, to also <laughs> confess oh, yeah. I'm not a boat yeah. person. <laughs> I am a boat person. And, and um, to set the mooring means to place the mooring with the ball and the chain and the whatever, whatever. But to tie off your boat on the mooring is a different... In other words, you've got to have your boat tied to the mooring and use, using, actively using the mooring itself. As I said, you can place or set your mooring every year, year after year after year, and I know people who do that off of Peaks Island and never put a boat on it, but they don't ever want to give up their mooring, and that's an, that's an, it's an issue I know the city of Portland has been looking at. Uh, and, I, and I believe that, is, if, if I'm recalling the conversation that we had, that was part of the concern of Mr. Anderson, too, Officer Anderson was, He's not quite sure because you know he's out and about and he has no way you know because boats could be in and out you can haul your boat out for a week because you have an engine work done but it is on the moor you know what i'm saying it would it's, be good to have uh, uh the harbor master come the next time yeah and uh, we'll just carry this over to the yeah next i meeting. think that's a good idea and we'll ask if yeah have it's more. the mooring as of july one has to be set in the in uh, uh, the mud beneath the right. water, or is it the boat has to be attached to the mooring? Right. Which I'd I, like to see the boat. It's got to be in use. I, but that's my. Opinion. I think that's it. Because right. otherwise, if people just register it, they go, "Well, that was all. We we it preserved our rights." Yes, sir. I, Mr. Hall, I'm sorry. No, I, my recollection of Officer Anderson's comment was really in light of the fact that we've got so many people on the waiting list. Uh, it really is the act of having an active mooring being used. Right. So I, I think it's it's the act of the boat being attached to the mooring. I do too. I That's do. my recollection. And that was the intent of my language, but I am I'm admittedly limited oh, in yeah, knowing no, no. how to say mm -hmm. that in yeah. boat speak. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. You did a good job. Um, I, 
uh, two thoughts. One, if we're going to hold over, and um, I wonder if we should refer this language or, or pass this language by the Coastal Harbor That's, yeah. Committee. Yes. Yes, in fact, this is Article 5 of the Coastal Harbor and Waters Ordinance, which is totally in there. Perfect. Ah, perfect. So why don't we do that? Yeah. Why don't we pass it to them and ask them to do some work on it? To translate it into boat translate speak. Translate it into <laughs> boat speak for us? Yep, and I'll pull the, the <laughs> last remaining piece, the, the yeah. renewal application mm -hmm. that perfect. goes out to our, our current holders okay. and um, put the same sort of language into okay. that and send it as a full packet. Okay. And, and that makes good. Well, I'm sorry. Good. No, please. Uh, just one inquiry, I suppose, and maybe a suggestion. Under the subletting of mooring space, the the uh, the added suggested language, that refers to a non-owner vessel. Right? right. So I wonder if we should make that qualification. So the final sentence could read, each permit allows for one non-owner vessel to be moored for no more than seven days. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Is that the intent? Okay. I just, uh, that might be, add some clarity. Okay. Thank you. Yes. My, my other question was around uh, the requiring the proof. So actually, I guess this is this is about the boat registration and and the language that was added um, as the important information to know. Number one, proof of boat registration in the name of the mooring applicant is required prior to a permit being issued uh, on the waiting list permit. Um, how do we do we do we check that, Tracy? Is that something that we when we actually issue the thing? Do we? Are we I currently requiring that today? The process of issuing one. Oh. So I think that I understood from Officer Anderson that we do not do that currently. We don't do that currently. And that yeah. he is asking us to start doing that. Yeah, my, my concern was around the comment around that it's 10 years before you can get off this list that, oh, yeah. uh, and people are putting their names in, you know, anticipation of purchasing a boat someday. Um, that maybe we can make that clear that this is at the time that we issue the permit. And, or maybe it's clear enough as, as well, written, but. It, it's, so right now it says proof of boat registration in the name of the mooring applicant is required prior to a permit being issued. Is so there a way to strengthen that to make it clear? Okay. I think that's probably fine as long as that's the. the you okay. Know. I think that language will have more value to, and more, more effect on the other permit that Tracy mentioned, the one that's filled out annually. Because that will really speak to the issue. Oh, right. And show us right. the fact that you've got a boat that's ready to go on this, on this mooring. Yeah. I, I think agree. It's kind of awkwardly placed here. If someone is waiting 10 years out, they may not even own a boat until they have the mooring to put it on. I think the hope, though, by putting it in both places is that you don't put yourself on the waiting list. If, if One of the concerns that I, I heard from Officer Anderson was um, wanting to really in, discourage people from thinking of this as an, a revenue stream opportunity. So don't put yourself on our waiting list if you're not intending to buy a boat and you're intending to be able to, le to lease it out as part of your property in some way. So the um, by warning them ahead of time on the waiting list, it might keep some people from going on that waiting list to begin with. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, no, it's, impor I agree it's important yeah. to keep on the waiting list yeah. thing, but just to, yeah. just wanted to make sure that we weren't. Uh, but I think you're right, the language is probably fine. I, I wonder also if we need something around, because there's nothing that I'm reading that says that you have to have, that you couldn't have a second mooring for the same boat. Does that make sense? So, so if I own one boat, could I put in a an application for my other boat because I I can just use the same boat registration? Do we allow somebody to have two moorings? I don't know. I don't think there's any reason that you preclude that yeah, so long as they if they have two follow boats, the process. Well, if you have two boats, you'd have two moorings. You can't right. moor two boats to the same. No. No. Oh. Banging into each other. This is how little about boats. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can't they share? No. 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 <laughs> Tracy, can you tell us what the renewal process looks like? Do you send out notices to each we and send, every? We send out a notice stating when they need to get it back to us, and that you know the fines will double after a certain period of time, and then after another date, the so warnings will be. So every coming. single person who holds a mooring yep. permit yep. gets it, a notice. Yep. What time yeah, of year so do you send does. that out? Um, we normally do it in February, March. Yeah, okay. In that general area. All right. And I believe we and were that, looking at this for next year. Yes. And, and that list finishing. exists in your computer, or do you get that from the Harbor Master? No, we have that. Tody has had a spreadsheet that we've been Good. using for years. Good. That's how we track it, so we know who has what and who's paid and all that. Yeah, stuff. okay. All right. Tom, you wanted to say something? Or nope. you? Okay. 
Um, do, do we think that's important to, to specify that each application has to be for a different vote in some form or fashion? I suppose you could say you have to have one application per vote or per mooring. Or you could, uh, if you're requiring a boat to be on a mooring, you're going to have to, even if you had 10 boats, you're going to have to have 10 moorings. Am I answering that correctly? Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the boat goes with the mooring. So that's why you register a boat and there's a registration number and it's a specific boat. And that's the only boat that the uh, uh, owner can attach there as the owner's boat. After that, it's a, a visitor. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my, my point was if I, if yeah. I were trying to do, um, you know, rent out a mooring, Pay, pay the $200 yeah. and, and run out of mooring or whatever it is. Um, and I could apply to get a mooring and use, and all I have to do is have one boat, but I could apply for multiple moorings. You would require, yeah, I guess we would want to be able to say that uh, if, if we chose to, one uh, mooring per boat is what's allowed in the town of Scarborough. That you can't apply to be for two moorings for right. the same boat. Right. Right. That. Right. Yeah, because some of these fishermen could, may have two boats that. that they use, mm -hmm. but they've got two. They right. need so to, they two to more. prohibit yeah. the yeah. use of the same boat. More. Yeah. Why don't we to ask, justify multiple more? I think that's something shall yeah. be. Uh, ask Larissa to, to draft language to insert. Maybe, maybe it's not an issue. I mean, maybe again, I would defer to the. But I, would, I wouldn't mind getting it in there. I also wouldn't mind uh, uh, this whole business about uh, are, are you uh, just having your mooring in the water, or is it your boat is attached to the mooring in the water? Mm -hmm. uh, if we could write that up and have that be what we're sending to Coastal Harbors mm -hmm. for review, it would look like they'd say, okay, we get what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that would, uh, I'd support um, votes to amend the draft that we have before us to include both of those points and then have that sent to Coastal Harbors for a review. So what you're saying is the next meeting of ordinance, look yeah. at amendments? before we send it to Coastal Harbors? Uh, I think Larissa could draft them and circulate them and we could sign off. Uh, without a meeting? Without a meeting and send it to Coastal Harbors. Because okay. it's got to come back to us anyways. Yeah, yeah. With all due respect, I, I think your purpose is better served. Um, I'm not sure if we know what problems we're trying to address. Right. And so I think it's better to bring this to folks that have and, a better appreciation and I only with all due respect. I only wanted no, to I, have them understand what our, <laughs> where our thinking sure. is at yep. this moment, what we think we're solving. And then they'll look at it, because we think we're solving that the boat has to be in the water attached to the mooring. That, that's what I think all of us understood Ian Anderson was telling us. That way, right. but you can't just it just doesn't mooring. sit there vacant. Right. This draft looks to me like the, it's only the moorings in the water. May I suggest a, a, another option that we could go with? Could I write up a memo that expresses the concerns and explain that um, we don't necessarily have the right language to use to accomplish our, our goals and that we're asking for their help to create that language? Yeah, true. That's fine. And also validate that, that's a, that our concerns are concerns that are shared and Right. Or actual valid concerns. So I could circulate the memo yeah. to you, yeah. and then that memo could be attached to the, the drafts as well as the, the draft that will be created based on the, the form that goes out to hold, current holders. And they could look. Do we know when Coastal Harbors meets? Is it as needed or is it set? Well, they have set meeting schedule. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Second They've had trouble Tuesdays. with quorums, but I think they're back to full strength, so I think oh, they're good. functioning okay. now. I, I would just m mention that it's more than likely there are members of that committee. Who are mooring holders yes. and may have personal differences with some of what you're trying to do. It's yeah. it, it's not lost to me that the uh, marine resource officer came to you and not to them first. Yeah. So it may be well, it may well be that some of the things you're talking about won't be well received by those. They may be, in fact, participating in some of this behavior. Well, so, would so it, just be would aware it, of that. I don't know. Would it be helpful to have 
I mean, I wouldn't mind going to the coastal harbors and, and talking to them, <coughs> given that I have uh, I think Larissa's suggestion is, is great uh, in terms of <laughs> don't go to the length of drafting language yet to say yeah. this is what we understand or what we heard from the Marine Resource Officer yeah. as issues. Look for their confirmation and then ideally um, maybe some suggested ways to, to close those loopholes. Yeah, I kind of see us uh, taking this draft with the memo that Larissa suggested and sending that to the uh, uh, harbor master to say, have we got this right? And then, then on to coastal harbors where it might be a mixed review. Or chilly but, reception. Yep. Or a chilly reception. I don't know that to be true. I'd like to get to where the harbor master thought we ought to get to. With the, with the draft, that's Agreed. all I'm saying. Okay. Is Mark Holston the chair? Of no, he's no longer on the committee. Oh, he was not on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I think it confuses it a little bit to not have a draft that it reflects what the harbor master believed was appropriate to uh, establish a better policy. And he probably speaks both. So I can um, get the language needed from him uh, to make sure that we're saying what is wanted to be said. And then circulate that draft back to us. And, uh, sure. So do we agree that that's what will happen? Then is uh, we'll get a draft. Larissa will get a draft using boat speak <laughs> from from the harbor master. from the harbor master. It'll be circulated amongst us informally without the meeting and then go to the, I would say, the next meeting of Coastal Harbors? Yes. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? That's good. And, Marissa, do, do you mind? Reminding me when that Coastal Harbors meeting is when you send that draft out because I will go to the meeting sure. and sit in. And good, that's very good. Tell them what we're thinking. Yeah. They may not be happy, but that's yeah, okay. Yeah, but you'll get a drift of it better than. Yeah, I'll know where they, you know I know some, where they're coming from. You know some of these people. Yeah, I do. All right. Uh, last but not least is parking restrictions on Scarborough Beach. In front of, I can't even talk, Scarborough Beach State Park. Uh, this is, I'll give you a little background on this one. This has been a perennial whatever. Um, you may recall the last time I was on the council, um, the manager, Greg Wilford, I guess he's the manager, whatever he is, at uh, Scarborough Beach State Park had come to the council wanting a long piece marked with no parking, you know, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, and we said no. Um, and it, it is, Tom, remind me, it, it's no parking, I don't know, it's confusing, but it's like this whole stretch, it starts at um, um, the women's home there on, on Black Point Road and goes all the way down through Pr to Prout's Neck or through Prout's Neck where it's very limited parking on, on the street, except in the winter. And so what's been happening is, and I'm one of the people, I like to walk on Scarborough Beach in the winter and, you know, you can park like right there in front of the fence, but apparently this year somebody took it upon themselves to post some no parking and it got very confused. Uh, it caused a real, I mean, a seriously ruckus. I was getting phone calls <laughs> as the ordinance chair. I happened to go down the walk one day for peace and quiet and ran right into the middle of Four people were fighting with Mr. Doan, who helps to manage the park, about the parking there. Anyway, uh, uh, in, I talked to the police department about this, and I don't see any reason why we can't say that there is no parking at any time in this very small portion. If you notice, it's only one-tenth of a mile on the entrance of Scarborough Beach State Park on either side because there's a crosswalk there, and there's, you know, it just clears it out and uh, I think would reduce some contention and make it very clear. So that's the background of this. And Larissa's uh, uh, drafted this for us and um, 
Did you come up with a one tent, tent or is that uh, the police department? No, nope, the police department recommended within the immediate vicinity, and I decided to interpret yeah, that as one tenth of a mile. Which makes perfect sense to me. That's easy. So that's where we're at with that. I strongly <coughs> encourage us to pass this on to the council, but I can see Will's mind is thinking on this. And, and what's the explanation? Why did why did they need the restriction? Is it for turning out? Well, the park the park itself has private licensing, I guess, or they sell passes year round, and occasionally people like myself. We're parking in front of the gates and parking, and it was making it more difficult. So, but they, anyway, they took it upon themselves to put up some signs that were a bit broader than probably they should have been, but I thought this would just make it very clear. The mm -hmm. police also mentioned that there are some challenges with queuing, that during the heavy season, if you've got people parked along the road right up against the entranceway, when you've got queues of people waiting to turn in, it just makes it more challenging for people that are trying to pull out, For like that if we can just keep that space a little clearer, that it's a safety issue as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I go there all the time, so I, I <coughs> see it. And except for the summer months, when there is queuing, and they, <coughs> they've had, they posted signs out there on sandwich boards uh, line up because uh, you're coming in a obviously a, a easterly direction towards the ocean on Black Point Road and so you can't queue up on the other side of the street those are all residential homes and on the uh, on the entrance side to Scarborough State Park you'd be pointing in the wrong direction You'd be going against traffic, and so. But they—that's what they've been doing. Those sandwich boards are up, and and I go, oh, be, because how do you deal with the line of traffic? Well, you have to go down past the entrance, do a U-turn either in somebody's driveway or go down to Ferry Beach and turn around, mm -hmm. uh, or down to the Black Point Inn and turn around. Uh, so it's it's very awkward in July and August. I believe though this. But it's not awkward any other time because there's not enough traffic there to make a fuss. Mm. Isn't this just no parking though uh, during the summer months, so to speak? There it's is like a, a six month worth. In other words, it's not a no parking any time on that Black Point Road. It's it's no parking during the summer months on it, that. It's May fifteenth yeah. to. September? September 1st or September 15th? Yeah. I and mean, I go by, I see the right. sign a hundred times, but I, right. uh, but I know it's May 15th to something. Right. So this is more thinking about the winter months. But, but that, that's, those signs, I think, begin after, uh, just, after after you, just after you pass the Scarborough State Park entranceway. Mm -mm. Kaler Vale. Kaler Vale has yeah. it. It's they start at Kaler Vale, and which Tom's is about <laughs> which is about two or three hundred yards before you get to the state yes, park entrance. At least. Yeah. I, I would direct your attention to uh, number four, the original number four, that does not appear to have any seasonal restriction, and there's two segments: one near Kaler Vale, and then from Ferry Road down to Prout's Neck Way, so the lower portion of Black Point Road. Well, that's no parking at any time, so, but there's a seasonal no old, parking. Oh, I'm not aware of where that is. This Kaler is Vale's area. by Kirkwood, right? Yes. And Old Neck is way the back by uh, where Peter Hayes lives. Isn't it a, a mile, Old Neck a mile back? No. no that's Old County. Uh, old Neck would be... Um, I thought it, it was... It's, it's well past Something the fire like station. Yeah. It's before it's right you the, cross yeah. the marsh there. Oh, you think it's past yes. the fire station? Yeah, yes. It is. Yes. And so the area that you're now talking about is between these two segments. Right. right. And so parking, as of now, is allowed with no seasonal restriction that I'm aware of. This is your traffic ordinance. So uh, that seasonal restriction, I, I'm not sure why those signs say that. It doesn't appear to have that restriction here. Hmm. Yeah, well... I wish I had the whole ordinance for me. I don't. 
at the moment. I suppose I could look it up on my thing. But it's my, because this is, this, this A sub one, and then sub whatever, one through whatever, is no parking at any time. But Black Point Road, this seasonal no parking from, and I could be wrong, but I am pretty sure, because I used to live down there. From Kayla Vale to, uh, I don't know, but it, it anyway. Old Neck is nowhere near Prince Neck. No. It's, no. It's way back on the other right. side of Camp Ketchum. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's, ru that's running from there to Kirkwood, is it? Well. Yes. But what this is, <laughs> all we're saying here is we're just saying regardless of what's going on anyplace else, mm. is that no parking within that one tenth of a mile from the entrance where that entrance is going either way which even in the middle of winter which normally there is parking allowed there that at least it keeps that area clear that's who, what the who, who raised the concern oh it was someone put up signs and then the police got confused about it and then people were getting given tickets and they're like yeah but we've always been allowed to park here and then when you look at the ordinance it is true they're see, allowed I think to park here. some people who don't have a parking pass to Scarborough State Park Beach park there and walk in but they can in the summer you no, can in the winter but absolutely they, they do it in the shoulder season absolutely <clears throat> but I don't think there's a no park the no parking. Let's see, old neck to Kirkwood. Well, before before you get to Kirkwood is before you get absolutely to, Kirkwood's way up. So by then the there's fire station. then there's uh, there is parking allowed along from Kirkwood to Ferry. No, it's seasonally not allowed. Where does it say? It? Kirk Kirkwood to Ferry. You got to go to the next part of the ordinance, which I'll pull up the ordinance. I'm pretty sure. Now my computer is... It should be yeah. seasonal. It should cover that stretch. It is, because this is just no parking at any time section. We don't and have the parts of seasonal, seasonal section. section. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. And so, I, my computer has just died. So we're, do, we're doing this in the uh, year-round no parking stretch. Yeah, just the tiny piece there. It's just a tiny piece. Why wouldn't piece. we do that just in the seasonal part? Because there is no issue off season. No, no, the, there is an issue off season. That's what the whole point is. There's an issue in the winter with people blocking the entrance to Scarborough State Park. Because there are ticket holders who have passes or whatever that they put into that gate so they can go in and park right. in there and, and whatnot. And it's been, they've been issues. Obstructed. Yes, obstructed and yeah. But is it just blocking the entrance? Because it's, I mean, this is two tenths of a mile. This is, and there's not a lot of parking. I mean, when you look at the map. Because you really don't want to, in the off seasons, interfere with no. people just walking and into the beach. This should be fine, in my well, opinion. Well, I, I would say. Uh, That's my opinion. A hundred feet each side of the entrance might be. Okay. Yeah, this is five hundred feet. However, you guys want to do it is fine with me. Because uh, I, agree, I agree that if they're is obstruction of the entrance way that the police say is okay. Well, how long is a car length? 20 feet. Well, that's what a parking space is. It's 20 so feet. 18 feet. to 20 feet for a parking so space. So 100 feet? Because I'm trying to think how many cars I'm <laughs> just trying to visualize. Well, I mean, how much obstruction do you need? Protection do we need, need to go back to the police and ask them what they thought? Because they had a, they yeah. had some thoughts on this. But if the concern is someone's blocking the entrance, 100 feet would certainly be plenty. Give you the the assurance that that's not going to right. happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm terrible with with distances because I know it's pretty wide because it's double. I'd be comfortable in having the, the police come in and explain to us. Okay. The problem. Because I, I could see people being annoyed that their custom and practice of walking in. Oh, absolutely. Uh, is uh, being restricted by. 
Well, let's move. Let's move this then back one more month. I mean, it's not a huge thing right now because it's going to be on season anyway. I think so, that's a good idea. So let's move this back and ask the uh, <coughs> the officers, someone, to come on in and tell us exactly what they want for yeah. a distance. Yeah, exactly. I Does that make sense? We also find the seasonal restriction that applies just so everyone yeah. appreciates what yeah. what else exists. Yeah, because that would be good to see. And just a final clarification, are you concerned with both sides of the street? If it's the entrance, I'm not. It, it's really the easterly side of the street. Yeah, yeah. it's... Uh... I would say just the me, because I go down there frequently in the winter, would be the eastern side. That's, That's where everybody course. parks. Yeah. They, just, they do a U-turn and, right. and all park uh, heading... I've never seen anyone on the other on side. East. No, no one parks on the west side because in the winter, it's, no. it's residential. It's... It's homes. Right. So that language should say upon the easterly yeah. side of Black Point Road. So we'll work on this some more or yeah, bring it back so. next month. Yeah, we'll get it right. <clears throat> Anything <laughs> else? Well, well, I think you've got your writing the same story the month after month. I know. <laughs> you can just, oh, that ordinance committee, they just can't get anything. <laughs> that, was, that was good. Any other uh, agenda items that we need to take up? Mr. Rowan, Mr. Donovan? No, I'll set. No. Can I have a motion to adjourn? To move. Second. All in favor? Thank you. That was good. Yep.